Hey! Welcome back, fantasy fiction fanatics. It's great to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. Today uh, is probably going to be a little bit short of a class, just since I don't have quite as much to talk about, but we're going to be doing the next five chapters of Dragonlance. Um, we are almost done with this book. After this class, um, it'll just be the rest of this novel, and then we'll be on the last novel and transitioning over to that one. So, we are getting closer and closer every time to completing this trilogy and completing another book that we can then compare to the last book, compare it to the next book, see how we are as a collective story, uh, which I always find is really interesting, seeing how the books fit together and how such an epic journey can be reached from the first book to the last book. All right, so these chapters are going to be five through nine is what we have reading today. So we'll go ahead and start with our recap as always. So we start with Fizbin and Tass visiting the gnomes in order to get the dragon orb. And then the knights hold the Council of the White Stone where Fizbin and Tass bring the dragon orb to that council. Uh, the elves show up for that meeting as well, and they are ready to go to war to get back the dragon orb that Lorana and her group took from them. But Tass destroys the orb instead uh, after everyone starts fighting over it. Uh, Lorana, Flint, and Fer uh, Theros show up with the dragon lances, and he's forged, uh, Theros has forged a couple of dragon lances, and he's showing them off to the knights and the elves. Um, Strum is then vindicated from his original trial that he had. All of his uh, commended crimes that he is guilty of is now going to be wiped clean because of Lorana's testimony. Um, and then Lorana is asked to go to see Strum and bring the dragon lances to the front lines in order to teach them how to use it and to deliver Strum's news so that way he knows that he is allowed to wear his father's armor once again. And even though she's a bit hesitant to go, she ends up going anyway. And then Tannis and his group find, um, end up traveling to a city where they can get a boat and they find someone um, to, uh, a boat to uh, travel on to take them to San Cris, or at least as close as they possibly can get to San Cris in the hopes of still meeting up with Lorana and everybody there. Though, Obviously, if he does get there, she's not going to be there at this moment. So we'll see what happens with that. And then last but not least, Tannis ends up being reunited with Kitiara, who we are shown is a dragon high lord at this point. So a lot of really interesting, exciting things happen in these five chapters. Um, but I don't have lots of big main things to talk about today. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see what kind of discussion we have for the couple of items that I do have, and then we can move on to getting to the next set of chapters and finishing up this book. So, the first topic I want to talk about are the gnomes. Because, you know, as we continue to see more races and more sets of people throughout the books, I always like to spend a little bit of time talking about them and seeing what kind of races we have in this world and what they're like and how they affect the story and that kind of stuff. So now we've gotten a really good look at the gnomes. We've been in their mountain, we've seen several of them um, interacting with our main characters, we've seen the kinds of things that they're interested in, uh, so we can discuss, have a little bit of a discussion on the gnomes. Um, first and foremost thing that you will see about the gnomes <laughs> is that they don't stop talking. They literally have no mute button, they don't shut up, <laughs> and they talk so fast that you can barely understand what they're saying to begin with. And that, I feel like, is the foremost front-running trait that they have, uh, especially when you're reading it and they the authors specifically take out all the spaces between their words when they're talking. And so you yourself have to kind of slow down a minute to figure out what they're saying because you have to add in all those spaces back in. So it's pretty funny because they're talking so fast 
that as a reader, you have to slow down your reading process in order to understand what they're saying. <laughs> so it's kind of a backwards thing. You can't just read it as fast as they're saying it and totally understand. At least I can't. A lot of times I have to be like, okay, let's take a step back. Let's figure out exactly what each of these words are so I know what the heck I'm reading. Because if I read it without all the spaces and I just go for it, half the time I don't ha comprehend what I'm reading. Um, and so all the characters pretty much cut the gnomes off, and that was actually one of the main things that they said at the beginning of the first chapter uh, that we were reading, chapter five. Let me see if I can get to it. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much the first line. It says, now remember, no gnome in living or dead ever in his life completed a sentence. <laughs> That's pretty sad. Um, and it makes it also seem, well, if you've never completed a sentence, that other gnomes cut other gnomes off. That the gnomes, even themselves, though they talk so fast, never let the other gnome finish what they're saying because they want to get to what they're saying. So that's pretty sad when your own people who talk just like you do not listen to what you're saying and they cut you off just like everybody else does. Um, and as we see with the gnomes that we are seeing in this, these couple of chapters, that they get really depressed when people cut them off because they're so excited to say what they want to say and yet nobody cares. Except for when it comes to Mount Nevermind, which they were so impressed upon that somebody could just cut them off and be like, never mind, that they named their mountain Mount Nevermind because they were in awe of how simple of a term was used when they were trying to describe this amazing mountain. Um, so yeah, that's, I feel like, the biggest trait that's just for the gnomes is their ability to talk and talk and talk. How many of you, comment below, this was you, were completely annoyed by the gnomes and you weren't even the ones talking to them. Let me know. Um, okay, so then the next uh, biggest trait is their similarities to the kinder because Tass even mentions, or it's Fizbin, I don't remember which, mentions that they do have a distant relative relativity to um, the two races to each other. So keeping that in mind, you know, you're kind of looking for simul similarities as you're reading. And they've got basically three main ones that I feel like you can really see. Um, the gnomes are really curious, just like the kinder are, especially if we're going to take Tass as a main example. He's always curious to know about things. People mention stuff that he's never seen or he doesn't know about or ways of doing things that he's never heard about. And he's always really curious to ask questions and find out about them. Or when he's in a new place to explore that place and to look around and see what's in the area. Because he's just genuinely curious about things. He wants to know about different things. And that's the way the gnomes are, especially with their inventing. They're very, very curious on how to make things better, make things more efficient, um, and knowing how things work because they are um, technology-based society. Um, they like to take things just like the kinder. This is definitely shown when Tass comes up and he's got his hoop pack staff and they don't know how it works so they just take it and run off with it i mean they are a bit different in the fact that they're willing their, their plan is to give it back to Tass when they're done experimenting with it and figuring out what it does and how it works unlike Tass, who just pretends he doesn't know that it's in his pouches and then it's like oh hey look at that look at what i've got didn't know that was in there uh and never plans on returning them but the gnomes do have that same urge to just take what they'd like and run away with it. Um, and then the third trait is that they're very upbeat people. Um, just like Tass is pretty much always happy, always ready to go. You know, there's very few times we actually see him either sad or down or tired or anything like that. He's pretty much an upbeat person. Um, the gnomes are very much that way as well. They don't get discouraged when people... Uh, cut them off even though they does kind of suck. They're like, oh man, but then they're instantly like going on to the next thing um, And they're upbeat with all their Contraptions and everything like that. They really are just excited people and really seem to love being alive and which is a great great trait 
so yeah that's what i feel like for me the similarities between the gnomes and the kinder are if you have any other similarities that you've noticed please list them down below for me and so we can have a little discussion and learn together as always all right so then the next main thing i feel like about their society is another one that's pretty obvious and that's that they are a technology-based society and they are inventors that's what they really really love doing is inventing things figuring out how things work trying to make new contraptions that will make things easier they are the apple or the i don't know <laughs> exactly microsoft the, the big company <laughs> that is trying to make new products and things like that for people to use and they're trying to invent new things that uh, in the end would hopefully be then transferred outside of their mountain laboratory <laughs> and uh, would be practical uses for, uh, for people and other societies. So yeah, they're, they're the inventors of this world. They're the ones that are the, um, I guess you'd say the opposite of magic. So we've got the magic people and they're the prominent people, but then we've got these gnomes who are really big into technology and building things with their hands and figuring out how things work and being the scientists and creating new things for people to use to make their lives easier. And even though their um, replacement for stairs is not that great. It is kind of like trying to make an elevator. They're just not quite there yet. <laughs> um, and so some of their inventions, you know, you're kind of glad that only the gnomes use. Uh, at the same time, they might eventually get to that point where they actually are starting to make things like technology in our world that is useful and is implemented throughout the world because it helps people out who don't have magic. And so then they're kind of the advocates for the, the regular common people to have better things and have an easier life because they are trying to create things for people who don't have magic to make their lives easier. So you never know, maybe in the distant future their, their future could look a lot like ours because the gnomes will have created technology and different uh, things like that. Okay, and then the last trait I have for the gnomes is that they're annoying, which we've kind of already discussed a bit with the talking, but really they're just annoying people. <laughs> they're the people like that we have in real life where they're talking to you and you don't really care what they're saying, but they just keep talking to you and you're just smiling and nodding like, I really wish I wasn't in this conversation. I feel like that's every single conversation with a gnome anybody at any kind of conversation with a gnome and that is why they get cut off so much because people have just decided that they know that gnomes are going to be like that and they don't want to waste their time with politeness and listening they just are like i'm out i'm done i'm not even going to care about what you and listening to you so just shut up and let me get on with what i want in my life so yeah great for the gnomes to be annoying um too bad they can't, you know, pick up on those vibes and maybe change themselves a little bit so that way they don't have that problem. Maybe in the future they will. We'll see. Or maybe they'll just forever be annoying and annoying the people of Kryn for the rest of eternity. Let me know if you ever want to meet a gnome. Because even though they're so annoying, I feel like it kind of would be interesting to meet a gnome. They're very almost... I always talk about how like kinder are kind of like children they're like the innocence and they you know are short and stuff like that so they kind of remind you of like the kids playfulness the fear they're not really fearful I'm not saying that kids aren't uh without fear but they're kind of like the the innocence of the world they don't really sense the danger they don't really get that kind of stuff so and because the gnomes are kind of related i feel like the gnomes are a little bit like uh kids too because they're the kids that are all excited and ex discovering things and running around and discovering the world and wanting to do lots of exciting things and to tell their parents about how wonderful the world is and all their fun discoveries. I feel like they have that kind of innocence in a different way as well. So, once again, what is the point of discussing these different sp uh, sp types of people in this world? Um, it really is still world building. And even now at the end of book two, we're still building this world and showing all these different types of people talking about 
the different things that exist in this world and showing the readers what kind of world this is. So it's exciting for a writer to continue being able to make new things and to have exciting things. But it's also very important for a reader, especially in fantasy genre fiction, to always have world building. Even at the end of book two, like literally we're five chapters away from the end, it's super important to keep building this world throughout your story because without any new surprises, without any new people, without any new knowledge of this world, it's gonna get boring because we don't know this world and without the knowledge, the background knowledge and the new people and the new information and continuing to build this world, people are gonna lose interest because they don't understand. They don't know what's in this world. They don't get it. And if they wanted to read a book about a world that they know, they would pick up a book about our world. But they want us to discover new things uh, and to be invested in a place that doesn't exist. And that's kind of the thrill, at least for me, not for everybody, but for a lot of readers is to discover these new things and these new species and to continue to see this world change and become something new. And as our story progresses to that world has to change along with our characters and develop and to grow to make us interested in this place that we're at. So it's always important, even this late in the game, two thirds through our collective three book story to continue building the world and to continue making new things for the reader to be excited about and to be shocked about and to provide new information about the world to us. It also shows for the characters new things, new uh, people to be in their way, new adventures to behold and adds a new dynamic to the story as well. So it's important for the readers on a world basis, but also for the characters and the story, in order for the story to progress, you need new things to come into play um, and new exciting adventures to take place. So for this, technology is something new and exciting that we haven't seen yet and how it plays into this world. And so the gnomes really do show a new side of the world and adventures that could possibly take place. We don't know now how, what um, the gnomes have provided, what kind of uh, technology the gnomes have provided to the enemy per se, or to our allies, or how that's going to affect these different things, um, and what role they're going to play in the future. So the next topic I want to discuss is Tass and Fisbin. And it's not necessarily because they are a huge part of this section, even though they are still a pretty big portion of this section, it's because we really see some major changes or some major affecting uh, changes in this section with both of these characters. So we already know that Fisman is not what he seems, um, but now we kind of see even more of that. So even though that's not new, it's still important things that are happening and we definitely see an important moment of change in Tass. A big, not necessarily, maybe change isn't the right world, but just something new that hasn't happened with Tass before is happening in this section. We see a different side of him. Maybe not necessarily a change, but just a different side. And it also could be a change. I mean, as a character development, he is developing. And he didn't develop really much in the first book. And he hasn't developed much through this second book, but now we're really starting to see something new from him. Possibly development, possibly just something that we didn't know he had in him and he didn't know he had in him which, again, could be considered a change in character. So, to start off, Tass has a moment when he is afraid, which has never happened before. Um, especially with Kinder being basically anti-afraid people. Like, you have to... There's nothing that most people know of that could make a Kinder afraid. But Tass is afraid. And it's not even of anything substantial. It's more about his actions and whether he's making the right choice or not, which means he's really, really reflecting on his choices and what he's about to do, which is break the dragon orb in front of all these people. And he knows that this could cause him his life. <coughs> Pardon me. Luckily it doesn't, but it's a very real possibility. And he's wondering if he's making the right choice. He's wondering if what he's doing is worth it. Um, 
which shows a very depth in thought pre-planned action even though it's kind of spur of the moment because he's in the moment of this council but he does take a moment to reflect on his actions and what will happen if he does follow through with what he's thinking and that is very very important because kinders usually don't premeditate things they just kind of go in and they're just like hey whatever like let's just go because they don't really have those fears they don't they're very spontaneous um Cass has been most of the time that way he'll just start going <laughs> it's not really thinking about any consequences and that's why Tannis and others have to really bring him in and be like hold on let's not let's not go over there uh quite yet let's think about this for a second but in this portion he's actually taking the time to think about what he's doing um it also shows how incredibly brave and smart he is because even though kinders aren't normally fearful in this moment with him being afraid you see that he is willing to overcome fear which is not a emotion that he's used to so with this being kind of his first in real encounter with fear he could backfire and freeze up and not do it but he does it anyway so it really shows how amazingly strong of a personality he has and how smart he is because he this is what saves everybody, really. This breaking of the dragon orb keeps them from fighting over it, and it really saves everybody. So he's very smart in knowing what needs to be done. Nobody else even thought to kill the, to, to smash the orb because they're so precious, and they feel like they need them. But Tass knew that the orb was what was tearing this world at this portion, at this moment, apart. These allies we're fighting and we're not going to get anywhere because of this dragon orb. Um, okay, and then we also see him finally take risks. You might think, oh, well, you know, a lot of times he just runs into battle and that's a risk. But for him, it's not really a risk, especially when he has all the people fighting behind him. His friends are obviously going to join him. Um, and you think he does a lot of crazy things, but really nothing that's really super risky for him this is super risky because he knows that it could cost him his life from his friends from the people he's trying to help and save um it's not quite the same as going into battle with a whole bunch of people behind your back this is a going against everybody who is behind your back and will now be your enemy and you won't have anyone to stand beside you so you really see that he is taking a risk here and like i said it's a growth of his character whether it's a change in his character it's a growth in his character because he is doing something that he has never done before he is thinking things through he is doing the big things we noticed in the last book with Sestin saving the gully dwarf and everything from the dragon he mentions to Fisbin that he can do the little things and those little things is what he's gonna focus on but this time he's actually doing something for a big thing He's affecting multiple people. He's making a decision that will lead races of people into doing something different because the dragon orb, we don't know uh, for sure, at least these people don't know, that there's another dragon orb out there. They don't know if they're going to be able to get a different dragon orb. They don't even know how many dragon orbs there are. So destroying this one could possibly kill everybody because that could have been the reason that they were saved. So he is making a big action and it really shows the growth of his character like i said with these other things that he uh that i mentioned previously as well as going from little actions to big actions next is fizbin which fizbin has been morphed into now like a new character he kind of had a transition where he came back uh from being dead and we saw that he was not who he said he was and now even though we still don't know who he is we really see that he's no longer trying to hide so much behind his befuddled character. He's kind of owned the fact that people now know that he is different and not who he says he is, and he's just decided to go with it. He's not explaining who he is, he's not giving away much, but we do see now that he is more powerful than he let on, and he's not fighting or hiding the information that he has to tell people. Um, but he also isn't completely serious either so we do still see those sides of Fitzpin, especially like when he's going to be on that contraption and he really doesn't want to be on that contraption 
uh, and continually ask what his name is to, from Tatas. So we see that he's kind of become a new character. He's become a mix of both the knowledgeable person and the person that is this befuddled old fool. So he's really developing into something new and metamorphosizing into something new that we will hopefully then see the full extent of in the end. Hopefully we will know in the end who he really is and exactly what his role is in this story. Um, but yeah, we see that he's very open with what the orb is, how it's used. He use, even uses it himself and talks about how he's used it to see the future. So he's obviously very strong considering uh, we see the interactions between uh, the orb and Raslin and the orb and um, King Lear, who went nuts with it because he wasn't strong, and and Fisben is so powerful that he uses the orb and doesn't collapse like Raslin. So he's obviously a very, very, very strong and powerful wizard who can use it to, and knows how to use it because he actually did something specific with it. Um, so we don't know much about that or why he's doing it, but he's very clear about who he is and what he's doing at this point. He's very um, clearing the slate, having it transparent, and being like, this is what I'm doing, and this is how it's going to go. He doesn't say specifically what he sees in the future. He just says he sees these two paths. He doesn't say how to go to the right path, um, because obviously he doesn't have the power to say, hey, everyone just do this, and it will be just fine. Um, he doesn't have that kind of control of over people, but he has planted seeds in characters' mind, especially Tass. Um, and we also see his speech and actions after Tass broke the orb, how he smiles at Tass and how he says that he took them to the harder path, but he's strong enough to walk it, and how proud he was and how he addressed the council afterward. Um, though after he dressed the council and the whole uh, Daryl's throwing the spear and him almost being impaled on it. That was another fizz, classic Fizzman moment. So um, we still see that little bit of mix uh, that comes back, back around to the uh, old Fizzman. So we still got to keep it interesting. Fizzman still got to make us laugh and make us wonder a bit. Uh, so yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, and there's also that interesting moment with Elliston. I almost forgot. Uh, where Fisbin passes by and they have that small interaction. Let me see if I can find where that's at. It's at the end of... It's the end of... Which chapter is this? Chapter 7. Um, Elliston was pacing the shore of Sandcrist, waiting for the boat that would take him back to southern Urgoth. The young man, Douglas, walked along beside him. The two were deep in conversation. Elliston explaining the ways of the ancient gods to a rapt and attentive listener. Suddenly, Elliston looked up to see the old, befuddled magician he had seen at the council meeting. Elliston had tried for days to meet the old mage, but Fisben always avoided him. Thus, it was with astonishment Elliston saw the old man come walking toward them now along the shore. His head was bowed. He was muttering to himself. For a moment, Elliston thought he would pass by without noticing them, when suddenly the old mage raised his head. Oh, say, haven't we met? he asked, blinking. For a moment, Elliston could not speak. The cleric's face turned deathly white beneath its withered tan. He was finally able to answer the old mage. His voice was husky. Indeed we have, sir. I did not realize it before now, and though we were but lately introduced, I feel that I have known you a long, long time. Indeed, the old man scowled suspiciously. You're not making some sort of comment on my age, are you? No, certainly not, Elliston smiled. The old man's face cleared. Well, have a pleasant journey and a safe one. Farewell. Leaning on a bent and battered staff, the old man toddled on past them. Suddenly he stopped and turned around. Oh, by the way... The name's Fisbin. I'll remember, Elston said, gravely bowing. Fisbin. Please, the old magician nodded and continued on his way along the shoreline, while Elston, suddenly thoughtful and quiet, resumed his walk with a sigh. 
So this is now the second time that we've had a character react by going ash and white over seeing Fizbin. First was Razlin, when Fizbin first was brought into their cage when they were when he was captured after arguing with the tree, and now with Elastan. Please tell me in the comments what you think. People who already know, people who've already read or read ahead or whatever else, please keep it to yourselves. Do not do spoilers. But anybody who is genuinely trying to make a guess of what they think uh, that has to do with, please let me down know down below. I would love to see what you think. Um, but yeah, so the point of bringing up Tass and Fizbin at this point is that we still see character developing. Again, kind of like the world developing, we're still seeing the character development even this late in the story. So just like with the world development, even characters need to be developed this late in the game of our story. So even though we do have had two books almost with these characters, it's very important for us to continue to keep learning them, to keep having more to discover, keep um, having new things happen and for our characters to change and develop and to become new people or not really necessarily new people altogether but just new things about them and that's also going to continue our story because without them changing they can't adapt to what's happening to them the hard times that they've had just like with any person will change you and that will lead them to be able to go forward through their story and to have new things happen to them so it's always really, really important for a reader, as well as a writer, to have these kind of changes for our characters and to be able to see moments of new things. The story would not be the same if Tass had not grown up a bit and uh, thrown this orb at the wall. And as Fizbin said about the future, there's the easy path and there's the hard path. Tass apparently picked the hard path, which is the path that will lead them, if they continue to follow it, to victory. But he could have very easily chosen the easy path if he had not had these experiences and hadn't changed enough to pick the hard path and everything could have been lost. So character development is still always important when we go ahead and look at stories even this late in the game. Uh, nobody wants to read about a character who never messes up and never has any problems and is continuing to go at the same as the same person not realistic either so everybody wants to see the metamorphosis of a character and to see what they will become from their struggles so I feel like this moment where Tass and Fizbin have honestly changed especially because these are the characters that first we thought Fizbin was gonna be dead so I didn't think he was gonna be able to change and Tass who has such a hard time changing because of his nature of not being afraid of things and having that innocence where you don't really feel like change is as able to be uh, happen with him especially with him not changing all the way through the first book and through most of the second it's really interesting to now see that they're finally making progress and they're finally moving forward and that finally there's something new and exciting happening with our characters all right my last thing i want to talk to you about is the thing that we're probably all waiting for and that is what is our first impression of Kit Tiara? She has finally entered the story after almost two books of knowing about her. She has finally entered as a character and not only has she entered as a character but she is a bad person. She is on the enemy's side and she believes that Tannis is also now on the enemy's side. Um, so, yeah, we even know that she's seen them in their progress on their journey because she was the High Lord that was, toward the beginning of this book, uh, helping burn down Flotsam. I believe that's where they're at, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was Flotsam, um, or whatever the city that they met. Um, no, Tarsus, that's what it is. Tarsus the Beautiful that was supposed to have all the ships. There we go. Tarsus uh, that got burned to a crisp and they escaped with Alhana and that's when their two groups separated and Katiaro was the Dragon High Lord in charge of that so did anybody else expect her to be the enemy? That's what I'd like to know first and foremost go ahead and comment down below 
uh, what your thoughts were on who you thought Katiara was going to be, if you thought we ever were going to meet Katiara. Did you expect her to break their meeting after their uh, time apart at the inn because she was a bad character? Or did you get that sense from the dream that she was going to be a dragon high lord? Or did you have any guesses? Or did you not know? Or did you think that they were still going to be a good character? Did you think she was dead? What did you think? Well, obviously you probably didn't think she was dead considering we had that dream that she was alive then. But, yeah, I would love to know what your thoughts were on Kitsiara and if you thought we were ever going to meet her and how you thought we were going to meet her. Alright, so back on to the first impressions. Obviously, your first impression might be different than my first impression, but I just thought we would go over the beginning of us having Kitsiara enter the story. First of all, she's not a very nice person. That's obvious off the bat. Not just because she's a dragon high lord and on the enemy side, but because of her mannerism. She doesn't treat anybody very good at all, and she makes these comments, uh, crude comments about, you know, any other man and I would cut them <laughs> or whatever, uh, kill them. I never let them disobey me. And the way she treats her officers, um, the way that she's just willing to kill elves and call them scum and, uh, how she hates the weakness of Tannis' elven blood. Um, she's not a very nice person. That's always off the bat. In a lot of the different small tells. Second is that she burned Tarsus and she knew that Tannis and her friends were in Tarsus and she was willing to burn the place alive and kill them. That's a wonderful first impression, uh, right? I mean, technically we did have her in that dream, but we didn't really have enough of her, I feel like, to really judge who she was. So that's why I'm saying that this is the first impression because this is the first real time that we see her other than her just battling in this dream. And obviously she's very prejudiced and has a lot of the views of the enemy. She hates, like I mentioned, the elven portion of Tannis's blood and she's cruel to people around her and so she obviously has very much the makings of a high, um, of a dragon high lord. So my question is, how could Tannis have possibly fallen in love with a person like this? Now, obviously, they've been apart for a long time, and before this, she could have been a different person. But I don't think someone can be that different of a person to then join the enemy and be this kind of a person and be a complete 180. I really don't think that it's possible that she was that different of a person. Maybe not quite as cruel, maybe not quite as open about it. But I think that that's who she was. And how is it possible that someone so unlike Tannis, someone, Tannis is a person who has morals and cares about people and always wants to do what's right and is guilty when, feels guilty when things happen and people get hurt and has all this leadership on his back of trying to take care of his friends and who also lo has loved Narana. And she's a wonderful person, completely selfless. Obviously, she was a little naive at the beginning, but now especially she's coming into her own and filling the role of Tannis with her portion of the group. She's really matured and really been a wonderful person and is willing to take risks that I'm sure Kitsiara would never take. So how is it possible that Tannis could love Kitiara. That's my main question, especially with this first impression, is how could you have seen any goodness in this person? How could you see somebody worth spending your life with? And someone who thinks so poorly of uh, one whole half of you. It's, it's a real mystery to me. Um, And part of me wishes I could see Katiara and the woman that he fell in love with to see how this happened, but I, I can't imagine that that she was that, that different. Like I was saying, um, it's clear though that she really, really is attached to Tannis for whatever reason. She grabs onto him real quick and 
like she mentioned, he's different in the fact that she lets him get away with things she wouldn't let other lovers get away with. Um, so, I don't know if her feelings really are love for Tannis. I mean, if they were really love, would she have left him um, after their meeting and never gone back for him? I have a feeling that Kitiara is all about herself and that, yes, yeah, she does have a special portion of herself for Tannis, at least at this point. It seems like that might be the case. Um, this really is only based on this first impression. I, um, I just feel like kids here at this point, from what I've seen from this little section that we have, it seems like she is all about herself. And you're probably thinking, well, you didn't get that much um, going from this little section, but to me, just her whole mannerism and the way she's acting and the way like she treats the bar person um it just seems like there's no way that this kind of person who treats everyone so badly could love a person who is such a good person and i can't believe tannis is just goes and sleeps with her and it's almost like the ron is out the window at one point when they were first splitting up in Tarsus, he realized that who he wanted to be with was Lorana and that Kitiara could never be the person that he really wanted because he couldn't be Lorana. He couldn't have that selflessness, that drive, that wonderful personality who cared about other people. So he even saw that in the fact that he chose Lorana. But then the second Kitiara is back in and he's just head over heels for her again. I don't even know totally if it's head over heels. A part of it, I do think, is because he's trying to play it off. So he, you know, she doesn't kill him. Um, so she's on the enemy and he's pretending to be the enemy as well. But he just seems like all his reasoning has gone out the window. He's not even trying to escape from her. He just falls right back into bed with her, playing their old games that they used to play. And it really is interesting that Tannis is so quickly fallen back into these old habits and it makes me wonder how Kitiara is going to affect him and whether he's going to be able to regain his senses or if he's not. This is going to be a big game changer especially because nobody else in his group knows that he's been quote unquote captured by Kitiara. But at this point, for me, it seems like he doesn't feel like he's being captured. He feels like he's just back to what he was with her. So we're going to see. This is a little bit of a sore spot for me, as I'm sure you can tell, um, because Tannis at this point is being led astray very easily. And somebody, uh, for me, I really love Lorana. I feel like she's a really great character. And as we continue to see what she does in the future of the books, um, you'll see why I like her a lot. So to me, it's kind of interesting how, you know, he's like, I made this decision, I realize who's best for me, and the second he meets his old girlfriend, he's fallen back in love with her. So we'll see what happens. What do you think? What are your opinions about Kitiara and Tannis and Lorana and all that? situation going on right now. Please let me know in the comments below. And now for, I've got two nitty gritty things to talk about. First to be mentioned is the gemstone, green gemstone man is back. And not only is he back, and he's on that boat they're gonna take, Tannis has let it slip to Kitiara that he's seen the green gemstone man. So now we're kind of working a little bit more of an angle, especially because we don't want the enemy obviously discovering something that's so um, helpful to their cause. And we don't know why exactly the Grimstone, Green Gemstone Man is going to basically help the uh, evil side win, but we also don't want them to win. So we're going to see how this plays out. Tannis, I don't think, meant to have that slip, but now that he has, and with the whole situation going on right now, I'm not sure where things are going to lead with that. So just keep that in mind that he's back. Both, well, the other side doesn't realize. Uh, the rest of Tannis' friends don't realize that's who it is. But Tannis has now discovered who that is. And Kitiara now knows that Tannis knows where he is. 
So we'll see what happens with that. And then the second thing is Gunther's comment about faith and magic. I thought that was just a really, really good, interesting um, quote. Let me read it. For me, it's on page 302, which is in chapter 6. Let's see. Here it is. It's at the very, very top of 302 for me, before the break. We have always been a people who looked to the gods for our hope, a people of faith who distrusted magic. Yet now we look to magic for that hope, and when a chance comes to renew our faith, we question it. Lord Michael made no answer. Gunther shook his head and, still pondering, made his way to the glade of the white stone. To me, that is a very, very interesting line, very philosophical line, very something to ponder, just like he's pondering it. Um, people's faith and what they look to for hope and guidance is very, very important to, to people, and it really steadies them, and their faith has been changed, and now that they're trying to get it back, they're questioning it, and that's just a very, very deep line, in my opinion, and something also to ponder, and ponder what that means about the knights. So, it's not that I really have anything specific to say on it, because there's not really much to say about it, it's more of something to think about. Uh, maybe in the future we can talk a little bit more about it and how it comes up later and stuff like that, but I just think it's something to keep in mind, something to ponder, ponder how that affects the knighthood, ponder what that means for them as a people, ponder what that means as for Gunther, because he recognizes it. Um, spirituality and, sorry I shook the camera, um, spirituality and that kind of stuff is a, a lot to do with how people do and what they act and how their community acts, so yeah, anyone else like that line? Anybody else intrigued by that notion and thought that was really interesting to think about? Let me know. And if there's anything that I talked about, obviously in this class, you're always welcome to comment any questions comments or concerns. If you want to have a chat with me about something, if you want to explore something a little bit deeper, let me know, as always. All right, so that's the end of this lesson for those uh, five chapters. The next class is going to be on the last chapters of the book. There are technically five chapters and then the little funeral portion at the end. At least I believe it's called the funeral. Let me double check. Yeah, the funeral at the end. So we are going to finish reading the rest of this novel for the next class and we'll be able to discuss it and get ready for reading book three. I hope you guys are enjoying the adventure as always and I will see you in the next class. See ya!